So this particular lesson is entitled Believing God. <clears throat> I get fired up, front two rows, bless you. I might spit, y'all know that. But for real, they know. It's like, oh, bless. But um, <clears throat> I really believe that um, the advancement of the kingdom of God cruxes right here because the way has been paid. Jesus has done what he can do. The spirit of God in us is fired up and ready and able. Everybody say and able and able and willing and confidently sure that you're the right person that we collectively are who he did good. He chose us to do this. But I'm telling you, we enter this issue of believing God, not believing about God, not believing, not knowing things about him and thinking about, no, no, I'm talking about believing God. Who's gonna, who's gonna stand up and believe God? Who's gonna stand up and remember who he is, remember his character, remember his heart, remember his impeccable truth, character, integrity, honesty, purity, and take him at his word in my life, and then together we collectively take him at his word as one. And we are going to, that's going to change everything. Because I can guarantee you when we do that, Aslan is on the move. He has a powerful agenda. There is, whether we like it or not, a short time. His army is mobilized. And he wants more. Please don't forget the more. We're going to start in Numbers 13. I just want you to hang with me. We are going to fly through. Everybody say fly through. Just hang on, okay? Numbers 13 through 15, all right? So we enter the story. Do you remember the declaration that this church is in a Joshua hour, right? So I want you to remember what Joshua did. What did he do? Come on. He took the land. He led the army, the Israelites, to take the land, to take hold of the promises that had been promised to them generation after generation after generation after generation. So this was a mighty warrior, a powerful, trusted leader. And he had learned from the best to believe God, but we're going to back up before he was a leader, when he was still being, well, he was a leader, but he was being trained as a leader, right? And we're starting in verse 13, I mean, chapter 13. So the Lord now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites. Everybody say giving, yeah. giving. This is a key word. God has made a promise. He's giving them the land. God has promises over your life. He's happy to give you the kingdom. Who's in? Who's in to receive it? Just asking. Okay. Stop striving. He's giving it. Send one leader from each of the 12 tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. I love that about Moses. He always did that. If you could count the number of times in scripture, Moses did that. God said he did. That's a side story, a side message. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out the 12. All tribal leaders of Israel from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. Then he names all the tribes, which is awesome. These are the names of the men. I want you to get this. These are the names of the literal men that Moses sent out to explore the land. Moses gave these men instructions. I love Moses. He's awesome leader. As he sent them out to go, and he says, go north through the Negev. Tells them where to go. See what the land is like. Gives him instruction. What he wants him to do. See what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak. Well, that would be good going into battle, right? 
few or many, see what kind of land they live in. Is it good? Is it bad? Do their towns have walls? Are they unprotected like open camps? Like we can't go in easy or is this going to go down hard, right? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened, hmm, God's timing to be the season for harvesting first ripe grapes. So these sweet, great people, leaders, they went up and they explored the land. And they went there. Going north, they passed through Negev, go through all the towns. And then when they came to the valley of Eskol, Eskol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. We're going to stop here. I need you to get a visual with me. Large men, large men. Grapes. Y'all, come on. Grapes. Grapes? No. On a pole. Pole. So large that it took two men to carry them. Bless. I'm still. I think this is what God said. I make it. Oh, yeah, we're getting there. I'm just saying God's true to his word. Okay. <laughs> they bring them, so they brought back these samples. This place was called the Valley of Eskal because the cluster of grapes the Israelite men cut there. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen, everybody say seen, and showed them the fruit. Visible evidence. Am I right? Visible. Yeah, yeah there's some visible evidence. I want to know how they ate those grapes, but that's a total side note. <clears throat> They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit from the land. This was the report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it indeed is a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Huh. I think that's what God said for generations is going to happen. There's a land I have for you. This land is flowing with milk and honey. It's a good land. And I have it for you, and you're going to take it. I've told y'all, I want to pass through all of them, everybody in heaven. I want to see Jesus. I want to see my daddy. I want to see some family. And I want to go. I'm going to say, Joseph, I'm going to come back and talk to you. Moses, give me just a minute. Take me to the Israelites who lasted four generations with zero evidence and still passed on the truth. There's a land. There is a land. And it is yours. And he is giving it to us. You can count on your good God. And his word is true. And you are chosen. And you are powerful in his might. And I know you see slavery. But that is not your destiny. And we will see God move. And you will take this land. I want to go see him. I want to look in their face. And I just want to say... Thank you for your faith. You never saw any of it. And you knew it in your bones. That's going to be important in a minute. Okay. Back. So, here they are. <laughs> this. Uh, we entered the land you sent us to explore, and indeed it is a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But I want everybody to circle verse 28, and I want you to put a fat X over that word. And I'm not kidding. Just as a reminder of this lesson. But, 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 but. Here's all the evidence. Here's the manifested truth of the promise of God for thousands of generations. We're poised. We're ready. But what are your buts? I mean, you understand what I'm saying. What are they? Because they really need to go. Seriously. I'm not, I'm not even joking a little bit about that. But... He says, the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. 
We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Now, I'm going to, not a theologian, please. Okay, so if, I'm just saying. I try really hard to get this accurate, but I'm telling you, if you go back to Genesis, descendants of Anak were these kind of giant, half monster looking, you know, humans. They're, they're big. They're not just like, oh, they're tall people. No, these are giants. Okay. I give them credit. Like they're seeing this with their eyeballs. They're seeing the giants. Okay. And they're saying, we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. He's telling them, it's good. The Canaanites live along the coast. They were careful. They paid attention. But they are talking right here with evidential fruit about all that they see that would hinder the promise of God, the word of God, the character of God, and the identity that they have that we just talked about. But Caleb, you can circle that one and don't exit out. But Caleb, I love Caleb. I named one of my kids after Caleb. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land. I love Caleb. He said, we can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up and against them. I want you to look at this verse in 31. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. Nice declaration over yourself. Lovely. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. Enter unbelief. Enter unbelief. We're going to come back to that in a minute. It's a sad day when unbelief filters in. Okay? How did you enter the kingdom of God? If you believe in me. Right? Am I right? Is this how we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? And then we confessed him with our mouth. And then that declaration of that marriage, one is, I'm one, old is gone, new has come. But we enter the kingdom. God is God. He could have chose any way for us to enter the kingdom. He could, name it, he's God. He said, I choose for you to enter my kingdom through believing how important is believing if he says this is where it all crux is right here i've made the way jesus is ready the holy spirit can come in you and cannot be stopped through you but it hinges for whatever reason god decided it's going to hinge on believing Well, I am here to declare to us that if we enter the kingdom, if God decided back then that we're going to enter the kingdom and we enter the kingdom through believing, we're going to keep entering and keep taking the kingdom by believing. This is how we access and appropriate the kingdom of God. In one scripture in Thailand, when we were in Thailand, we would would teach our kids these scriptures. And they were little, and so we would find short ones, you know. Or we would find a long one and shorten it, you know. And so this one, though, my little one, he would always say this. The work of God is to believe. The work of God is to believe. And the other one say, in Jesus. And we would walk around our house. Please, Jesus, help us in Thailand where all the people are bound down to their, you know, spirit houses, seriously. And they would say, the work of God is to believe in Jesus. And I'm like, praise the Lord that the work here is to believe because I got nothing, right? I got nothing. Jesus, you're who I've got and your love for these people. And they used to walk around. I'm not kidding. I'm giving this for an example. Okay. They used to walk around to the spirit houses and my little boy, you might he might be ours if you knew my husband. And he would say, in Jesus' name, I command you to fall down and come under God. Okay? And he would do that. And then we tried not to just kind of go, you know, all these people. This is their love. I mean, this is not happy acculturation going on. Okay? Because I'm like, hey. but they're warriors and we want them to be and we train them up to be. So their daddy said one day, we, got, we had done a prayer walk around our neighborhood. And their dad said, hey, guys, y'all come here. 
I said, um, he said, I want you to know something. And I'm, I always do this when Eric gets down with him because I'm going to listen to what he says. And he said, I want you to know. I want you to know that you're exactly right. You're exactly right. We want those things to bow, right? Voodoo is not more powerful than God. Nothing in the earth is more powerful than Jesus. And there does need to be a submission of will, but he said, I need you to understand, son, that what we, all we need to do is pray for them to come to a revelatory knowledge of God's love. He didn't use that word. We need them to see and know, but that's what he was saying. We need them to see and know and feel that God loves them. And the second they see and feel and know that God loves them, they will go and they will tear. He said, they will tear those spirit houses down themselves. And they were like, oh, well, let's go, Daddy. In Jesus' name, I declare you know God's love. That's what they would say every time they saw a spirit house. And they will know God's love. And I'm like, yes, yes. And I just would meditate on that. They will tear those spirit houses down themselves. Come back. Unbelief. Unbelief is the one thing. I believe this with my whole heart. We have a flesh man. And sin is a major, I know you're going to say, you said it wasn't. No, sin is a major problem when we choose it and hold on to it. But it's not a problem when, we've, when Christ has made the way and we y- willingly yield it over. But what is a problem after we willing y- willingly yield over our sin and our flesh man and crucify it because out of the love of Christ, what is a problem is that believers sit in unbelief over who we are and who our God is and what he said and promised us. And it costs us, and it costs the generational line, which we're about to see, and it costs the world out there everything. Because we're sitting in unbelief and we've taken it in because of what we see in the natural. Instead of going up and believing God and believing his character and believing his word over your life personally, over a church, over a city, over a nation, and over the nations of the world. So here's Caleb, sweet Caleb. He's trying to calm him. He's trying to say, don't, don't talk about this. The land we traveled through and explored will devour. And this is what they say. They, Caleb's saying that. They're like, we can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report, and this is what they say. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. Oh, lovely. So now they're not just big. Now they're going to devour us. I need you to watch the progression here. It's an important progression, okay? Because belief progresses into manifestation and the demonstration of the kingdom of God. That's what it does. Look at your own life. Unbelief has a progression and a manifestation. And it ends in death. I'm telling you, it ends in death. Whether it ends in your physical death, your spiritual death, your emotional death, unbelief, as it is played out and manifests, results in a robbing, stealing, killing, and death. And we cannot tolerate it anymore. The cost is too high. And we're going to keep seeing it. After explo- uh, I'm sorry. Then the whole, verse chapter 14. Then the whole community began weeping aloud. I want you to look at what happens. Enter the emotional trauma and turmoil of unbelief. Then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Everybody say all night. Y'all, the whole community. Men, you're crying all night. This is some kind of power. No, listen to me. There's some kind of power in this unbelief. It does unnatural things. Men don't cry all night. I know they don't. Well, they did. They did. Weeping aloud. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest. Now watch what unbelief does. Against who? Moses and Aaron. So, as unbelief, as unbelief begins to take its course, it's going to cause emotional turmoil and trauma, induced largely by fear of some sort. 
And then it's going to find its way to attack leaders. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So I want to encourage you. There's probably many things that we can do when we find ourselves in unbelief to wake up from it. But guaranteed, if you begin to, in your heart, and I'm not talking, let me be careful here. You, if you believe, if you begin in your heart to attack leadership, and I mean attack, I don't mean share vulnerably, honestly, you know, brother to brother. I'm talking about what we're about to see here. You need to ask Where is the unbelief? Where have I stopped trusting Jesus? Where have I stopped believing him for the promises over my life? Where is he in charge? Where is, where, where am I taking hold of his goodness, his character, his heart for, towards me? So here they go. And now they've, they're, they're raising, they're coming in protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt. Y'all, what? I read that scripture. I was like, are you serious? Are you serious? You are on the cusp. Seriously, it's time to take your land. And you're saying, if only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. What? He led you through on dry land. He heard thousands of years, hundreds hundreds and hundreds of years of prayers for your deliverance. And you got to walk through and you're saying with your mouth, I want, I can't. Except that we are these peoples. Sometimes. Here he goes. Why is the Lord now the accusation against the character of God? Why is the Lord taking us in this country only to have us die in battle? Okay, so now, here we are. And now we're accusing God that his desire for us is death. Y'all, this is serious. Do you understand? When unbelief begins to set in, it has this progressional power. And I mean, it's like we lose our minds, literally. It's like we're going we're gonna to not believe who he says we are. That's verse. We can't do this. We're going to look at every opposing obstacle. Oh, crud, got to run. I can't do this. And then we're going to come against our leaders and gripe and complain all the time. And then we're going to accuse God's character. What? How did, how did we get here? Keep going. Gets worse. Not encouraging. Oh, what comes out of their mouth next? It just terrifies me. Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Exactly, sweetheart. Exactly. Then they plotted among themselves. Let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. I love Moses and Aaron. I want to be a leader like this. So obviously, they have some rebellious, scared, uncooperative people, right? Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of, I don't know how to say that, Jepune, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do you hear the belief in this statement, y'all? This is believing. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection. <laughs> Because the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Enter the voice of believing. Enter the voice of faith against unbelief. Earlier in this, they say that one of the, one of the reports is, they're big, they're scary, it's too much. And to them, we are grasshoppers. And then they come in agreement. We look like we are grasshoppers to them. And that is who we are. So Joshua and Caleb are coming against this agreement of the wrong kingdom, right? We see all the obstacles. We see what's coming against. And now we're going to get an agreement that we're just nothing over here. We're just peons with no power. And they're bigger and they're scarier and it's hard. So no. We're not so different. And Joshua and Caleb come and they're like, we got this. We got this. 
He said thousands of years. But remember our good God. Remember his character. He took us through on dry land. Remember the, I mean, don't you just want to say, remember the miracles. Come on. Right? And they're like, no. Okay, not happening. So I want you to listen to what happens to the voice of faith amidst unbelief. Here we go. Got to find my place again. What verse am I in? 10. Verse 4 of, of chapter 14, right? Okay. So, no. Then I will... Hold on. Where am I? I lost myself, y'all. Sorry. 10 of what? Megan. Okay. Thank you. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Y'all, we laugh, but it's not so different. The voice of faith, the voice that says we're going on, the voice that says, here we go, we're going to take the land. And unbelief is in the camp, and now we're going to kill each other. Literally. Now we're going to do whatever we have to do to shut that faith thing and that believing thing down. You think there's some spirits in operation among the camp? I'm just asking. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. Thank you, God, for showing up. And the Lord said to Moses, how long? I want you to hear the word of the Lord here. How long will these people treat me with contempt? Y'all, do you understand that, how strong that word is? This is direct opposition. How long will they stand in direct opposition? Complete contempt of me. So this unbelief becomes very personal to God. Will they never believe me even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them? I will disown them and destroy them in a plague. Then I will make you into a great, greater nation and mightier than they. But Moses... I'm telling you I love this man. I might stop and talk to Moses before I talk to this. Maybe. What? Well, the, he goes in. I love his intimacy with God. You talk about bold as a lion. There's some guts coming out right here. I'm just saying. But Moses subjected. What will the Egyptians think when they hear about it? He asked the Lord. They know full well the power you displayed in rescuing your people from Egypt. Now, if you destroy them, the Egyptians will send a report to the inhabitants of this land who have already heard that you live among your people. They know, Lord, that you have appeared to your people face to face and that your pillar of cloud hovers over them. They know that you go before them, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Now, if you slaughter all these people with a single blow... She's totally capable of doing. I love that Moses in the middle of it reminds him, I know how powerful you are. The nations that have heard of your fame will say the Lord was not able to bring them into the land he swore to give them, so he killed them in the wilderness. Please, Lord. Do you remember that these are the ones that are wanting to kill his leaders? I'm sorry, I've been in leadership. You want to kill my leaders? I'm not, I'm not for you. You're just going to have to deal with it, okay, because I'm going to protect them. And, yeah. I'm going to save that for another day. I'm just saying, here comes Moses. And he says, where, why do I keep losing my place? Thank you. Please, Lord, prove that your power is great as you have claimed. For you said the Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. He just starts reminding God who he is, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. But he does not excuse the guilty. Did you hear that? He does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins on the parents of their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. And there's a lot to that right there that I don't have time to go into. I'm just saying, I'm reminding us, sin has consequences. And we want to live in radical love and obedience to the Father. In keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of this people, just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. Then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you, Moses, have requested. I will pardon them as you as we have requested, but as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter that land. I want you to start seeing and feeling the weight of unbelief. 
They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my, my voice. They will never, ever even see the land I swore to their ancestors. None of those who have, here it is again, who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. Here God is describing to us yet again the magnitude of how it moves the heart of God for us to believe him. To stand on his character in spite of any of the swirls, any of the battles, any of the attacks, any of anything that would come against in the natural that we can see with our eyeballs, to come against his character, against his heart, against his faithfulness, against his assuredness of his people, he, it matters to him. So much so that none of these people are ever going to see it that chose to stand in unbelief. But my servant Caleb, everybody said, but Caleb, I want to, but Caleb, but my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others. He has remained loyal to me. I want to know how I'm asking the Lord, how do you remain loyal? Bible uh, from what I can see in this story, he believed. I just want to say he believed. He has remained loyal to me, so I, everybody say, God says, I, I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants, everybody say, his descendants will possess their full share of the land. Come on. Their descendants, not just him, their descendants are going to (laughs) have their possession. Now turn around and don't go toward the land where the Amalekites and Canaanites live. Tomorrow you must set out for the wilderness. You want to know where unbelief leads? The wilderness. You got a land flowing with milk and honey. You got every evidence of the promise of God. Oh, you got some, you got some giants for sure. You got some walls, some fortified walls. Who cares? You have your God. then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron how long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me here we are again this unbelief y'all that causes them to accuse God it's a serious deal yes I've heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me now tell them this as surely as I live declares the Lord I want you to look at this verse verse 28 you want to get your mouth under control, this would be the place to get the conviction to do it. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. We're going to have a whole lesson on the power of the tongue and our thoughts and our words. Because if we're going to get free, this thing's going to get lined up with what he says. And who he is. You will all drop dead in this wilderness. Because you have complained against me, every one of you who is 20 years old or older and was included in the registration will die. Y'all, I'm just trying to take on the magnitude of this. Okay, We're talking a whole generation. You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions. Everybody say the only exceptions. Will be Caleb and Joshua. What was the only that I can see distinguishing difference between all the others and Joshua and Caleb? There's just one. They believed. Okay. You said your children would be carried off as plunder. Well, here we see the grace of God. I love how he he can't not be gracious. It's just who he is. You said your children will be carried off as plunder. Well, I will bring them safely into the land, and they will enjoy what you have despised. Thank you, God, for your grace. But as for you, you will drop dead in the wilderness, and your children will be like shepherds wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Guys, you want your children, physical or spiritual, to take the land. Could you please... Get serious about believing the character of your God and the word of your God. 
In this way, they will pay for faithlessness until the last of you dies dead in the wilderness. Because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And the next time you want to, to tamper with or play around with unbelief, just know it doesn't just take today. It tries to take a whole lot more than that from your life and from your generational line. A year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sin. Then you will discover that it is like what it is like to have me for an enemy. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will certainly do these things to every member of the community who has conspired against me. Guys, do you hear how strongly, I mean, this is, it's like you're conspiring against the very nature of me, the integrity of me, the promise that I have preserved and held and given over to you. They will be destroyed here in the wilderness and they will die. The 10, oh, leaders, I want you to listen. Please listen up. The 10 men Moses had sent to explore the land, the one who incited rebellion against the Lord with their bad report were struck dead with a plague before the Lord. Of the 12 who had explored the land, only Joshua and Caleb remained alive. Leaders, because you have a place of influence, because people trust you, you must, by the grace of God, tend to this place. You must hover it and watch over it and guard it. You have to keep looking at your God and believing him. There is no option. I know it gets hard. I know the giants are big. I know that I know that it seems impossible. Believe anyway. Look at him longer than you look at the giants. Look at him, listen to him longer of his faithfulness through generations and do not waver. You set your face like flint as a leader and you know your God. And you keep telling him who he is in face of all of it until you see the manifestation. Because it will happen. We're getting there. When Moses reported the Lord's words to all the Israelites, they were filled with grief. That's another thing unbelief causes. Because when in his mercy, he finally does let us see our unbelief, it's grievous what we've lost. It's grievous the time, especially when we can't get it back. And they got up early the next morning and went to the top of the range of the hills. Let's go, they said. We realize we've sinned, but now we're ready to enter the land that the Lord has promised us. But Moses said, why are you now disobeying the Lord's orders to return to the wilderness? It won't work. Don't go up to the land. Basically, you're going to get killed by your enemies because the Lord is not with you. When you face the Amalekites and Canaanites in battle, they, you will be slaughtered. The Lord will abandon you because you have abandoned the Lord. I want to ask you how they abandoned the Lord unbelief but the people defiantly pushed ahead towards the hill country bless these people they're going to figure it out eventually that he's in charge and they are not even though their moses neither moses nor the ark of the lord's presence left the camp i don't think we like consequences any more than they did so i'm not going to get real judgmental of them then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in those hills came down and attacked them and chased them back as far as Hermah. <laughs> then the Lord told Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you finally settle in the land I'm giving you, you will offer special gifts as pleasing aroma to the Lord. And he goes into all of these things of what they're, what's Basically, he comes to Moses and I believe encourages him here and says, it's going to happen. I know what you see. I know it's hard. <clears throat> but you're going to see it, Moses. I mean, you're, I mean, I'm not saying you're going to see land. I'm saying he's saying they're going to take the land. Promises again. Speaks the promise again. They're going to take the land. If you go on in this, which is a great thing to do. We don't have time to do it tonight. But if you go through all this, basically what happens when they get right on the cusp following Joshua. Remember, this is your Joshua, our church. 
when they follow Joshua and they take city after fortified city. It gets interesting, right? I mean, who, who would have thought to blow trumpets and knock down your enemies? It, and then there's the circumcision right in front of the enemy's camp. You know, like there's stuff. You, they got to keep trusting God as they take their land. But what happens when they enter the land, what happens when they get right there is God says, oh, in here we, it, he says that God kept Joshua and Caleb alive. They're the only ones of that whole generation that didn't die in the wilderness. And he ushers them in. I love this when you, when you read it later. And basically, um, jo- uh, basically, God says, come here, Joshua. Come here, Caleb, by name, individually. And he says, bring, basically, he says, bring your descendants. They get, you get first pick. The next time you want to cower in unbelief against your enemies, when the promise of God has spoken, Could you please, if you can't do it for you, see, see your descendants. Think years down the road when the battle looks hard and Jericho's staring in your face. When God asks you and commands you to be circumcised, incapacitated, taken out, and trust him. When he asks you to step into that river again and it's your dependent on the waters opening again. When you come, because they did come to the land flowing with milk and honey, who had descendants of Anak in it? They didn't get smaller, people. What happened is God was believed. Only difference. When you're standing right there, can you please think generationally? And beyond that, can you please look at your huge God who is faithful, can you do what he asks us to do over and over? Remember, 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 remember. Can you look at him square in the face and say, I'm not giving up my land. Not my marriage, not my child, not my church, not my city. Not my neighbor, not my nation, and not the nations. I'm not. Not when I can look at this God that is all-powerful, all-faithful, trustworthy unto my very life. I'm not giving it over to unbelief. You can forget it. And I may die in a thousand ways in believing God, but I'm going down and up and in believing God. And when you do, not only what is cultivated, the biggest gift that's cultivated is intimacy. I want you to know something. Before Moses lives his whole life, y'all, he leaves everything to take him into the land. You understand this? I mean, the burning bush, gotta go, scared to death. I wouldn't want to go before Pharaoh. By the way, that's my brother I grew up with, and now my nephew's dead. This is not an easy path. But he gets called, and he is faithful, and he experiences his God, and he spends his whole life with these people. You just said, you just saw it. God, he's, I mean, they've been totally attacking him against him, and he's just on their face pleading for their life before God. Leaders, that's a really great example. Right? And then he gets right there, and God says, come on up. What? And Scripture says that God, God buried Moses. What? And the crazy thing is I don't think he cared. Because by the time it was all over, in this journey of obedience and trust and honor and believing, all he wanted was him. What he wanted was his name, his glory, his renown, his character to be made known. Do you remember him going back? God, he already knew he could have the land. 
What he wanted was God's favor and renown and glory being known and shown. Something happened transformationally in Moses. I want, I want to believe God in such a way that I could be standing on the cusp of what I'd worked my whole life for, and I don't care because I just want him. I just want him. And I'm just so thankful that I got to journey in such a way and had so much grace on my life to believe him and do the next thing and love in a radical way against everybody that hates me, talks about, I don't care what, just I just want to love him that much. And then I want my descendants to know how to take the land. Huh, go get him, baby, go. Go get him. I got to go. You go. I'm telling you, some of your generational lines are on the cusp. Don't you dare quit. Stare at him longer. Go back and remember more. Do whatever you have to do to hold on to trust and faith that it's going to happen. Jericho is going to fall. We're going to inhabit Anak and all his descendants are going to say bye-bye because they have to. Because God, your God, is with you. Personally, the two that believed got what God had promised. Collectively, they inhabited. See, individually, because they believed they got their portion, and so did their descendants. But collectively, they took the land. They experientially knew the promise of God as the manifested evidence, y'all. You can have your little peace, but I'm telling you, we've got a land to invade. We got a nation to invade. We got a city to invade. We have nations all over the world to invade with the gospel of Jesus. And it does start with two who will believe. And in Jesus' name, right now, as we get ready to go tonight, I declare over us individually and collectively and over this church, it's your hour. You're positioned. You're ready. And it is time. And there is great, great cost. So in Jesus' name, I declare that the people here in this church will radically and passionately root out even the slightest stench smell of unbelief. A sniff of it is not okay. I declare that with your mouth you will begin to testify to one another to the goodness of your God, to the power against any anything that opposes and sets itself up against the knowledge of God in your personal life, in your family's life, in your generational line, in this church, in this city, and in this nation, and in the nations. You will begin to speak with a radical, radical faith, declaring who your God is, saying and declaring you can take it. You can take it. You're going to take it. You are taking it. And you will have every grace and every empowerment to take the next step of faith, to walk through that Jordan River, to be circumcised, and anything that needs to be cut away, cut away. You're going to be humble enough to be laid out and look at nothing but God as your Savior and your Deliverer, and then you're going to go up and you're going to do whatever crazy thing he tells you to do and you're going to walk around and you're going to blow trumpets and you're going to watch your enemies fall and then and then you're going to do it over and over and over as many times as it takes and then the manifest presence and power of God over this church over this city and over your family and over your life is going to manifest and you're going to experience an intimacy with God that you would trade it all for that is what is going to happen I bless you. I love you. We are coming back tomorrow, and it's going to be awesome. What? Okay, amen. (laughs) This is how it is. Okay, so tomorrow, really quick. um, I know that's just, Lord, we just sit in that. It's just who, it's it's how it has to be because we're children of God. (sighs) Just breathe it in for a minute, right? Because you know your battles, y'all. Yes, you know your battles, y'all. You know them, and they seem giant. They seem giant. 
I'm telling you, get your eyes off of him and get them on him. You go back and you remember and you tell yourself and you declare with your mouth out loud. Thank you in Jesus name. And when it costs you, you go ahead and let him cut away. And that hurts, by the way. I'm not a guy, but I'm just saying. I know that it does. I got boys. I'm not joking. It hurts. There's a cost to taking this land. There's a purifying fire that's going to come. And you're going to go, I don't know if it's worth it. Oh, it's worth it. And you go ahead and let him do whatever, whatever he wants. Whatever and however. And when you just feel like you're crazy because you just left the best church in the world and the best job and the best boss you've ever had. And he says, you need to move on. And I want to throw up. It's because I didn't see you people yet. I'm not kidding. I couldn't see it yet. It took my best friends four years of prophesying over me for me to finally step into it. But I finally obeyed. And I'm telling you, your faces will be etched forever. I don't know what crazy thing and at what cost he's going to ask you to do to take your land. But I'm telling you, it compares nothing. It does not even hold a candle to him. Because the best gift I have right now is that I feel him closer than I've ever felt him. Even though the cost was greater than anything I personally have had to lay down yet. You are worth it. He said it. You are who he says you are. You have a God that does not fail. He does not fail. He does not fail. And you can bake your whole life. They did. Waiting on the promise. Remember those? Four generations. Oh, they're good. You look at Hebrews and they say, you know what? Some of them didn't see it. But we're together in this deal. And they're banking on you. You understand that? They believed. They believed. And they need you to believe. And God feels really strongly about it. In case you hadn't read these two cha- these three chapters before. And he, the biggest thing is he is worthy, y'all. He is so worthy of your belief. He's so worthy of your circumcision. He's so worthy of your trust. He's so worthy of your radical obedience. He is so worthy. And he's your prize. And if you, by the time you're done journeying with him, you really won't care about the manifestation. You'll just care about him. And then your descendants. Well, they'll just take the land in ways you couldn't even imagine. So Lord... I just pray right now. Again, let's just agree. We're going to say yes, Lord, again, because that's what got y'all into this whole thing anyway. One, two, three. Yes, Lord. We choose to believe you. We choose to believe you, God. And I pray for the grace for every single step of this, for every one of these people in Jesus' name. Amen.